your hand on your heart, look up at the sky, smile and say, hey, (laughs) I'm alive. Thanks for being alive with me today. Welcome to Be Alive with Kate Manser. I am here with the one, the only, my friend, the Renaissance man, Jeff Price. Welcome, Jeff. Hello, Kate. Thanks for having me on your show. So Jeff is not just any guest. Jeff and I have a long, long long-ish relationship. We've been friends for, I don't know, about four or five years now. And Jeff is one of the most interesting people that I know. And Jeff, I, I think I've told you this before, but one thing I just admire so much about you is your prolific nature as an artist. And I call you a Renaissance man because Jeff is a painter. Jeff is a writer. Jeff is a musician. Jeff creates apps. Jeff is also builds things amazingly with his hands. He's built a cabin with his bare hands. And um, Jeff creates art like every single day. So I just kind of want to talk about how do you create art every single day, Jeff? (laughs) Yeah, thanks for that. You've always been such a big supporter as well, Kate. So thank you you know, for the kind words and just your love and support. And, you know, I really, I admire you for so many reasons as well, I want to say. And, um, but as for the creativity aspect, you know, I, I, I don't know how I, and I think it's a habit. I think I've just gotten into the habit of needing to like do something, whether it's writing or, or playing music or building or fixing something, or, you know, if you put me in a space, I'm going to be fixing stuff. I'm going to be doing stuff. I'm going to be active. It really feels like therapy at this point that I just, I've let go mostly of like destination ideas, although I am project oriented, goal oriented, but I I do like, I pretty much I'm on a, on a level of like creation at this point where I'm doing, doing it from a pretty, I think hopefully very honest, pure place without any, like, like I'm not trying to, you know, get, get like awards or notoriety or like trying to be in it for ego reasons. I'm trying to be in it for more like process and more like from a spiritual place. Uh, you know, I'm really interested in plant medicine and, and circles and I'm in the jungle, you know, technically at this moment. Like, <laughs> so in the jungle. Yeah. In, I mean, in more ways in than one, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I live in that area. Like when in, when you're there, like might as well drink the medicine of the jungle. And so that's what I've been doing. And, you know, it's really taught me a lot about, yeah, where I'm coming from uh, as far as my creativity goes, like, who am I? I mean, the, the definitely sitting in circle, you know, it's like a lot of therapy on one night and, you know, it's helped me purify, I think where I'm coming from and why I'm doing what I'm doing. And just to bring it up to current events, you know, I'm right. I'm just like writing songs a lot right now. I'm just in that flow. I'm in that flow writing music. And obviously my novel is still being written. I'm working on that daily, but my, the majority of my time is creativity time is spent writing songs, but also, you know, I integrate creativity to, you know, I was changing out the mosquiteros in this house, you know, the, the, the screens, the mosquito mosquito screens. Yeah. And so we're pulling down those and changing down mosquiteros, you know, building shelves, building, you know, tables, you know, fixing this place up, getting it up to speed. That's creativity as well, in a way for me. Like, I do think of that as creativity. So I don't know. I, I want to live that ashram life, Kate. That's kind of my, like, I want to live that ashram life. You know, that's my MO at this, mo- at this moment. And my, my, uh, my desire for creativity is in ritual and then, uh, you know, ritualistic behavior, like very dedicated, consecrated action, mantra, mantras in the mind all the time. And, you know, doing like, you know, sound healing circles, drumming, group, group, group music, uh, medicine circles, integration, you know, living that life where you're in like, you know, on the verge of a dieta or a time of integration where you're after the ceremony trying to make sense of it it's just kind of in my path right now with these shamanistic sort of rites of passage i'm putting myself through the fire at this moment honestly and um you're really good at that actually i've seen you do that in so many ways and i know that the story siddhartha is like profoundly close to your heart 
but I don't know if you know this, but you're kind of, you're sort of walking that path in a way you're, pu- you love putting yourself in, in challenging perspectives. I mean, when I first met you, you were living in, yeah, one of the cabins at this retreat that we were both working at outside of Austin. And then you built your own cabin with your bare hands, which was absolutely gorgeous and is still rentable on Airbnb, I believe. If you wanted to go stay in Jeff's cabin in Dripping Springs, I'll put the link in the show notes. And and it's amazing. And Shout Shout out Casa Paradiso. Shout out Casa Paradiso at 13 Acres in Dripping no Springs. Thing. But you didn't have running water there for a while. And then slowly, yeah. you you know, you, sure. you you started to bring in your shower and the sink. And, yeah, and then nice. you left everything and you moved to Mexico. And actually before that, for I think a year, you traveled around the country in your uh, beautiful white used Escalade spreading peace and kindness. And I just feel like yeah. this you've been on such an adventurous and minimalistic in a lot of ways life. And I struggle with that. Like I love the minimalism. I love things that are hard, but I also love comfort and I love like a certain degree of opulence. And, uh, yeah, I look up to you in that way. Yeah. I look up to you, uh, in that way, you know, let me ask you, I see in your background, you're in your, uh, beautiful be alive boutique. My studio, yeah. Yeah, the Be Alive studio. It's Be Alive, right? Totally. Mm-hmm. Okay. I was just making sure. Um, how's it going so far? I mean, you you this is like week two. Oh gosh, yeah. I think this is like week three, and it's been it's been a man. I got really into this idea of like, because this is a really large space, I was like, oh, I can have meditation space, which is what is behind me here is this beautiful meditation circle. And then up front, I'm going to have this boutique. And I got really into the idea of like having this physical space and having people come in, which I'm still really, I love that. I love when people come in the boutique and I get to talk with them and I meet them. People come in for meditations, uh, you know, and people buy my book and whatever. But I'm starting to realize now in week three that I kind of like over focused on the boutique and setting all that up. And it was a it was a lot of work because I'm realizing like, okay, like your main goal for this year was starting this podcast. And as of this recording, like I'm collecting all these episodes and I'm going to be putting them up as a season. But not one of these episodes has been put up yet. And I think you and I kind of share that in that like we get really excited about ideas and we're like, squirrel, squirrel. (laughs) And so like here we are, like you asked how I'm doing in week three. And in week three, I'm like, maybe you should have just made it a content studio for like the first month. That's what I'm thinking. I got super excited. And uh, and now I'm like, oh, my gosh, what, what did I get myself into? I think you've, at least you've you've pivoted in the right way, and and sometimes we set out for reasons we don't understand, and we pivot, we move in the right direction, and it sounds like that's what you did, so that's good. I mean, I'm learning, I'm learning along the way, and I I always say like I would rather be more passionate and more distracted, I guess, if that comes along with it and have more ideas and visions than to be the contrary, which would be, I guess, maybe apathetic or disinterested. But I do struggle with just like, woo, life is beautiful and there's so much going on and I could do this and this and this. And I actually am reading Matthew McConaughey's book, Green Lights, right now. And there's there's a point in the book, I think you'd like it, Jeff, uh, yeah. But there's a point in the book where he he had a record company, he had a nonprofit, he had his acting career, he had a production company. And there's one point in the book where he had to shut down, he decided to shut down his record company and his production company, not because they weren't doing well, but because he wanted to, he said, I was making C pluses in all of those. And I wanted to cut the fat and start making A's in two of the areas. And yeah. I can definitely learn a lot from that. Wow, that's a great thing. I wonder what films he made after that decision. I wonder what the film subsequent films were. I'm sure I wonder if it was True Detective and like the real high quality stuff because he moved away from the rom-com. You know, maybe that was when he was in his rom-com, you know, 2000s making all these like films with Kate Hudson and and about the, you know, 
the professional guy that just can't, you know, be tied down. And, and then, you know, this formula, these formulaic films, like that he made all those years. And then I think he, then he, you know, obviously true detective is like the big come out party for his, like, I think, I mean, D- Dallas Buyers Club as well, like for him and as an mud, actor. Yeah. yeah, Mud 2. Mud 2 was like the beginning of it. That was a good film. But I feel like it really culminated with like, you know, that character he played in uh, True Detective. It's just like one of the great... That's, that's when I became a Matthew McConaughey fan. Is that... Really? Yeah. Honestly, before that, I was kind of like, take him or leave him. But after that, I was like, no, I'm I'm on this train. Like, I get it. Like, I'm with it. I think it was around the birth of his child, he said in the book, where, yeah, he was. You're exactly right. He was making these movies that were paying the bills, but were not challenging him and were not, you, you know, the, the stories that he had always wanted to tell. And yeah. so with the, with the birth of his child, and obviously there's a lot that goes, a lot of time investment and energy investment in being a dad. And he just realized, yeah, cut the fat. And then after that was when he said he called his agent or his lawyer or whoever and was like, I'm not doing those rom-coms anymore. And, and he's like, how much time do I have? He's like, money-wise, right? Like to survive. And he's, wow. he's like, you're good for a year. And so, but a, a year, the where I am in the book right now is like the year's kind of gone on and he hasn't gotten any new offers to, uh, to do the kind of work that he wanted. Yeah. Wow. What a cool book. Yeah. I should read that. What's it called? It's called Green Lights. Green Light. Okay. Okay. And so you're getting stuff from that. If you're, you're getting some, you're gleaning some wisdom from it. I mean, the day I put, picked up the book, I was, it was like the week that I, after I had opened the shop and I went to one of my favorite places in Marfa, which is this little, this park in front of this big open West Texas field. And there's a couple of art pieces there. And I was just, I wanted to go outside and read, but I was exhausted. So I looked through my book collection and I pulled up one book and read a page and like threw it across the room. And then I picked up another book and read a page and it was too too dense for my my poor tired brain. And I threw it across the room. So I went back to the bookshelf and I was like, what can my little brain handle today? And I was like, all right, Matthew McConaughey bio, auto bio. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. And I it's just it. so good. I mean... As someone who works in the personal development, personal growth field, I'm always reading these books like, how can I make myself better? What can I learn? But those couple times a year when I read a fiction book or a good like Matthew McConaughey autobiography, it's just like cotton candy melting right on the tongue. It's easy. It's breezy. And it's like a little vacation. Yeah. It's like a coconut cream drink you buy on the side of the highway. And it's just like, I know there's sugar in here, but it's so good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And didn't you read um, Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck by Mark Manson recently? Yeah, I did. I did. Oh, my gosh. I'm glad you bring that up. That book is so good. I did read that. And I'm so glad you brought that up because whew, I, I've just been like, <laughs> you know, I've been I've been reading Siddhartha again. Obviously, my perennial go to it's not that's not a, a one and done type book now that's a, that's an over and over type book yeah but i um i did i read that book earlier in the year and like like in january and he has some really important messages and a cohesive vision like it's a really important book for this time for for this time in, in history and this it might not be relevant you know, in 50 years, it might, it might totally be phased out of the human consciousness because it won't be relevant for where we will be in 150 years or whatever. But for now, one of the most important books, I put it up there with like a new earth. Like, I mean, it's so important. A new earth. Uh, you put it up there with, oh, with, oh, a cart totally a new earth. Wow. That's some high praise. (laughs) Yeah, I do. Well, cause it's, it's like from the ground, it's like, spirituality in in a in a very like humorous and tough love kind of way and 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 it's almost like the groundwork that needs to be done for any of those tools that Eckhart Tolle delivers to be absorbed like I feel like if you don't get away out of out of get away from your like narcissism and you know and recognize that it's pervasive and if you don't recognize your there's just so many messages in there that are important about, you know, about 
how to stop being your own worst enemy with, with yourself, with others. And it really dismantles that. It's almost like a how to dismantle this egoic tendency. And I feel like because it's a how to book in a way, and it's really effective that it's like, as far as the greater good and the benefit, I feel like I'd rather have people read that you know, then some like, you know, spiritual bypass book. And I'm not saying that that's what a new earth is. I'm just saying that like, sometimes what we need is like the tough messages of, of how to, how to live in the world and how to operate and, and to, to like dismantle some of our like childish understandings, you know, and that's what that book does. I, I love it. Like, I love that book. It's almost as good as yours. That's what I've been doing. Almost. <laughs> Thank you. But, I mean, I've been working on that a lot right now. Like one thing, especially that I've been on just in 2024 is releasing my need for my parents' approval. And it's something that I didn't really fully understand that I even needed. I was like, I don't need my parents' approval before. But, but then I realized that I kind of did. I kind of was waiting for it. And when they, did, when they didn't give it to me or where they, were, where they weren't paying attention or giving me what I needed, I would, yeah. I would get really like lost and depressed and it would bring these feelings up from childhood of being shut out. And, and at 39 years old now realizing that the, the approval that I need is from me, but it's, and that sounds so simple and so cliche, like, oh, you should approve of yourself and don't worry about, but to actually really realize that and, and to approve of myself first. And then if someone else outside gives me approval, great, that's nice but not be desperate for it. I don't know if you've heard of the concept of the hungry ghost, but the hungry ghost is, is this concept of, I think it's like an old Chinese uh, notion of this being who has desperation for something, whether it's love, attention, affection, but there's this void inside that they're trying to fill through, you know, relationships, friendships, parental approval, whatever. And while I don't think that I necessarily, I'm sure I have been a hungry ghost at different times in my life. I don't feel like I had that with my parents right now, but I do feel like I was waiting around for something that now my work is, my work is less about saying I don't need the approval from my parents. And it's more about just really trying to approve of myself and gut check myself and value check myself. And so it sounds a little bit like this was the message of, of that book, but it's definitely wow. still a work in progress for me, well, but it's been profound. Yeah. Moving away from that book. I mean, it, you know, I think just on a personal level, that's, you know, a good place to be. And you, it feels like the realization that you had about, you know, it's not about your parent, whether or not your parents approve, it's about purely whether you approve of yourself and like by maximizing the approval of yourself, it sort of like negates any tendency to even seek the approval of your parents. And I, I think that's very insightful for you to like go that route rather than like keep looking at your parents and keep looking at that. Like, it's almost like, um, like I have this vocal activation teacher that I've been working with and it's really unlocked a lot of, he's really transforming my life. He's really changing my life. Uh, his name is Kul Kul Balam. And he's, he's a great mentor, a great teacher, a great carrier of the fire. And I, I really love and respect him so deeply. Um, but he's teaching me about singing and about toning and using the voice and, and, har you know, harmonic throat singing and just the, the sound of our voice and how important it is to use it very specifically. And he's teaching me about that. And he speaks of, you have to give yourself the gift of singing to your heart. And, and he says, if you can sing to your heart, you can, you can, others will receive the, the, the voice, but you have to sing to your heart first. And then it may resonate elsewhere to others and penetrate them and, and bring them up and open portals maybe and really be a powerful. His voice is, is the kind of voice that opens portals. I mean, I mean, I mean that. And, you know, what you're saying is, is 
you know, you need, you're, you're seeing how to appreciate yourself so much. And it's hard, Kate, that is hard because I want to feel appreciated. And when you're not feeling appreciated, it sucks. It really sucks. And and it makes me resent people. So uh, that's a tough pill to swallow when you don't feel appreciated by someone. And whether or not it's true, it's hard. It's hard to swallow that pill. And when people go out of their way to recognize you and say, I appreciate you so much, it makes you more grateful for those people that appreciate you. And it makes you want to be around them. It makes you want to support them. And so maybe a way for you is to like, rather than confront anyone about not supporting you, maybe one way could be to open up the conversation one night casually at dinner about support itself and how much, like, let's go around the table and just talk about whether or not you feel supported. You know, I mean, this is like, it feels like a very neutral way to ad- to do family therapy is to address, open the topic up and go around the table and be like, what do you feel about this idea in general? And then not to point fingers and not to like, but I like, like, like rather than going on an offensive mode and like, like being like, you don't support me. Like, what if it was just like a conversation that happened at dinner one night and then you, and then you connect on a heart level. And you're able to share your truth and you're able to hear their, where they're coming from. I don't know. Maybe, maybe sometimes people just don't get it, you know, but I, I like to try to shape the ones that are in my life, you know, and shape them to what I want them to be because the, the transitory people, they'll, they'll just go away. But if it's your mom and dad, it's like, they're not going anywhere. You just have to like kind of hopefully shape them in a way that you want them to be if they're not, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I think it's like a delicate balance between what you're saying, which is like when when I say I want to work on myself and 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 really deeply approve of myself, I think you bring up a great point, which is like that doesn't mean that we shouldn't engage with other people, be an example, lead conversations that can help ourselves and the other person grow. It's not like only focus on yourself and just live your yeah. life in a vacuum. But there is a balance between for deeply accepting myself first. And then when I, when I get to that point or when I make some headway on that point, there's no like there, it's just like, it's always a progress, but, but along that path, there is an, an element of like detachment. I feel like that has to come with that because if we're having the conversation with the goal of like, you know, my parent isn't enough or I'm expecting something, then like there's disappointment in that. But if it comes from a place of I'm working on myself and I'm going to open this conversation up and it may go one way, it may go the other way, but I'm sort of detached from the result. To yeah. me, that's, that's because I just say that because I've gotten myself into so much heartache over the years by but you, expecting things from people and especially my parents. And, and I've been, I've done so much better when I uh, just love them for who they are. But then also like yeah. you're saying, be the example and don't be afraid to ask hard questions that they probably will be uncomfortable answering even when they're not you're not saying oh why aren't you supporting me even bringing up the conversation oh what does support mean to you how could i better that could even be uncomfortable to them do you think so personally oh for sure yeah any conversation that's like about a real thing i mean it's not uncomfortable where they're like you know gonna run away but it's it's not like easy breezy shoot the shit kind of like small talk yeah you know, I, it's like, in a lot of ways, these relationships are already set. Like, my relationship with my mom is pretty set up. My relationship with my dad is pretty set up. We don't have, like, wide open parameters. But in some ways, we have, I have more than wide open parameters. In some ways, I share with my mother and my father more than I share with anyone else. But in other ways, I don't share with them much at all. And so, I think that... I I just I feel like like there's having some degree of acceptance for like what you just said like I accept them where they are they're not this all in all Swiss Army knife that's everything to me all the time all the things but in some ways they're great in some ways they're not I accept you as you are and it's like that helps you have dinner that night in total peace and not feel like there's any tension and to help you know experience the moment with them. We never know what's going to happen tomorrow. It helps you experience the moment, to be in their presence and enjoy their presence. 
enjoy their spirit. They're not going to be perfect overnight. You can't change them. Like I can't change my mom and dad, like one, you know, they're my dad's 77 is like, he's, I'm glad he's alive. You know, like I want him to live a long time more. And I think about just hanging with him and spending the time with him. And, you know, my mom's, you know, like 68, she's in great health. I think she's going to live to be a hundred. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it's like, you know, I think, you know, sometimes we clash. Like if I say something, sometimes she gets stressed out. She's a hard worker and she gets stressed out and she'll like, ah, you know, like she gets triggered pretty easy on certain topics I've learned. But other than that, we're smooth sailing, you know, she's not a big hugger. I was never like held and sung, you know, like she's not like, she's not like such a like hugger and affectionate and like, I love you so much. Like it's just, she's not, I've never, I've, and so I'm not part of my, uh, you know, like I'm trying to teach her about heart hugs. I'm trying to like get her to settle into a hug. Okay. Now don't run away. Don't run away. She gives me the tap back tap back tap. Okay, enough. I'm like, just you also thing, do that to me too. Yeah. No, I, I, you do this I, thing to me. You, you're like, you're like, Kate, don't shoulder hug me. So yeah. this is like, you, you're a teacher of this on so many levels. So oh. what do you do? You just like, you, you talk her through it while you're doing it. I'm like, just take three breaths. Can you do three? And she's like, yes. And I'm like, okay, let's just do one right now. Ready? Ah, okay. That's one. Let's do three together and hug. Are you ready? Okay. She can, she, I got her to the third breath one time and it was like a big deal. You know, like it's very hard for her. It's very hard for her. She's like, she's like, it just takes her like nervous system is like keyed up. She lives in a big city. She's never been in like, I mean, she's never, you know, really been in that kind of conscious community energy, you know, like that hugging, touching, loving platonic touch. So hugging is such a great way to to close the distance and to show trust and to show, you know, and to like listen and uh, to show that you care. And so, and it's silently, there's no words. It's just like uh, action, hugging. And, And just by being in someone's presence for a second and not trying to like squeeze them or, you know, but just by hanging and hugging and breathing, you know, it's so powerful. And like, she's just not used to that. Like I'm the first person that's ever done that with her for sure. You know, she's like quick hugs, back slap. See ya. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, wow, oh, hug you're me. really just inspiring hug me. me to do this. With him. Like hug me. Like don't like what you and I had that thing where it was like, I was getting the, I was getting the side hug. I was getting the, sh- the shoulder in some way. And like, I was like, do you hate me? No, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say that. I think I did, but I, think I you um, did. Yeah. But no, you have to give me shit about it. That's like one of yeah. my love languages is when, yeah, I told you that when like you scare me, uh, but, when we used to live yeah. on the same property together and Jeff would always yeah. like jump out and scare me and I would always love yeah. it. You as like it. Yeah. Yeah. You do like it. <laughs> yeah. I forgot that about you. You love being scared. That's right. Kate. Oh my God. I forgot it means that someone takes the time to an effort to scare me like to, and, and I grew up like our family would always scare each other. So I'm like, oh my gosh, someone took the time to like plan, even if it was just like a moment to like plan, they're going to like jump out from from behind this door and like yell to me. It's like, I don't know. It's just a way that I really feel seen. And uh, so every time you did it, I I really loved it. And and yeah, you did teach me about these shoulder hugs and it's still, I mean, I feel like, yeah, I still have more to learn about it. Well, yeah, 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 but but if you want to do it with my mom, like my mom's been on this amazing transformation journey with her getting sober last July. We're coming up on a year of her being sober and like pursuing a recovery. And this, I just feel like this is a. I'm glad that you brought this up because I feel like now is a great moment to. Yeah, because we hug like, but we do a lot of like the quick hugs and. And even my mom, like she, there's times where like I go to hug her and she like p- puts her hand up to fist bump me. And I'm like, we're not fist bumping here. And and I'll do a hug, but it will be brief. But 
yeah, those of us who are are pursuing, who are learning, any which is everybody, because we're all learning. Like we have, I think, a duty uh, and an inspiration to to invite people along, and they can they can get on the bus, or they can be like, no, I, I'm not buying a ticket to that today, and that's fine. But uh, but this is a cool inspiration for me to to try heart hugs with my mom. Like one, start with one deep breath, and like yeah, heart to heart with my. Yeah, and, and like and I like, can just feel rigid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, try to like my advice would be to like think of it like uh, a little ceremony. Just a little ceremony, a little moment. You don't have to say that word. People get like tripped out at that word. They think like oh, it's going to be this amount of time. It could be like 90 seconds, you know, 60 seconds. But like we're going to drop in, we're going to take a breath. Are you ready? Inhale. Ah. And she exhaled. And then you just and you go, okay, now we're going to, we're actually going to hug and then take a deep breath in and then out. Are you ready? Okay, let's do it. Hug in. Hold it. Mm-hmm. Out. Uh, uh, cool. That felt nice. You know, I get, that can be the end, you know, just one hug like that would be cool. You know, have you ever like done that with her? Like had a, had a nice, like slow hug like that with her? You probably have. Not in a long time. I'm sure I have. I mean, I, as you were talking about that and leading us through that, that cool experience just now, I was just thinking like how weird that, that we have to like build up to this, like, you know, 30 second hug when I was literally inside of her body. <laughs> like we could not have been any closer for nine and a half months. And now it's like mm-hmm. this big deal to to get and it's not just her it's me too to to hold on for 30 seconds and and so i that just brings more meaning to this beautiful bridge that we can build by doing that and i heard somebody say recently like oh i've never i i decided a few years ago i'm never going to be the person who lets go of the hug first and i'm not just oh. talking this person was not just talking about with their mom they were talking about with with anybody and well, so i've been sweet. playing with that, that is, a that's a sweet thing lately. that's a sweet intention yeah i, I like that's a sweet intention. Someone who will really hang there and be there with you. I like that. Yeah. Let the other person let go. <laughs> yeah. And then I would let go. I would let go and just be like, I see you. Thank you. That was nice. You know, like if someone's like holding that frequency of, of, um, you know, just like, like I hold space for you. I honor you. You're, you know, I'm here for you. I like that. Cool. Yeah, it brings to mind this, like, I don't know, I have this image of like, I don't know, with sort of vibrations and, but, but it's kind of like high level, right? Where like we meet somebody and we do like this quick hug and it's like, hi, and, you know, we do the small talk, but all it takes is one person to like do a key lower on the piano. Like you're, we're like, bing, 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 bing. And then you're like, bum, bum. And all it takes is one person to, to put that key lower on the piano to talk about something a little bit more vulnerable, to hug for a few seconds longer. And the yeah. f- whole freaking vibration of like the room and dare I say like the world can change just by, like you said, one, you taking an sec- extra s- few seconds to hug your mom or like a- listening to someone or sharing a vulnerable thing with a stranger. I mean, that's a true vibrational shift. But in, in, I think like the catalyst in there is. I don't know. What do you think it is? But like courage or because it takes a little bit of courage to do that sometimes to be a little bit different. Or maybe for you, it's like that, that meaning of like knowing you want to be on that vibration and, and, and bringing, bringing everyone around you to that. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's like, it's like setting your standards high for yourself. Like I want my day to look like this, like vibrationally, emotionally, like when you wake up, I'm like, I want my day to look like this and to feel like this. And when people press you and like stress you or there's stress that happens or people are coming at you like with weird reactions, like I'll give you an example, you know, like here at the ashram, I, you know, we had, we've had some problems with the refrigerator. And so last night, Ganesha want, wanted like, you know, I won't name names, but people to clear out the refrigerator because we have to clear out one of them, put it all in the back refrigerator, 
so the, and then unplug this one because it needs to defrost. This is what our technician told us. So, you know, so and so didn't do it. And we got back last night and he's like, they didn't do it. And so I did it, right? I cleaned out the refrigerator. Basically, when there's misunderstandings, when there's, let me say this, when there's misunderstandings and someone thinks that maybe you didn't handle the situation well or is questioning as to why you did something, when you have nothing to do with that, right? It's an opportunity, I would say, to either become like annoyed or resentful. Like that's how my, my, my initial response is sometimes annoyment or resentment. And I'm not, I don't like being pressed on anything or stressed on anything. Like come to me with like very, come to me with like a, a vibration of like constructive love and, 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 and genuine inquiry, you know, assume the best please. And not coming at me with like stress or, or, and I, and I, if someone comes to me with stress or even like an accusatory tone or thought in their mind, I feel it. And it's like, that's an opportunity for me to like not be, it's hard to, it's so hard to be uh, in alignment with who you want to be in this world. Like if I wake up in the morning and I'm like, I want to be this, I want to be this, I want to be this today. I want to be this vibration, this energy. And the first chance ha some stress happens, I'm like annoyed and resentful and that. And I'm like, ah, I just failed. Like game over. Like I just yeah. failed the, the, the quest for today. <laughs> so it's like, how do I maintain that frequency even when people like I'm living in a community and there's, there's, I'm the only one that lives here, but there's people in and out all day, every day. And there's like a lot of people that, that work here and live here and, you know, or just work here. I'm the only one that lives here, but there's a lot of energies, a lot of community. We're building things, you know? And so sometimes we get annoyed with each other. And I think that like, I've just been working on a lot of like, intention setting and like trying to, like I said before, at the beginning of this conversation, um, medicine circle is important to me and I'm sitting in like 10 days. I'm excited about that. And I have to watch my emotions and watch my energy and watch my peace and watch how I'm thinking and feeling and watch how I'm talking to myself. Like I, it, the, the preparation is so important. And that's kind of why, like, I love medicine circle because it gives me something to look forward to. And I know I'm going to be challenged. Yeah. I know, I know I'm going to, going to go into some depths that I've never been before. I know it's going to be powerful and, and, and it's going to be a lot. And so by having that to look forward to, that's my thing. I love looking forward to it. I love it looming over me in the distance in the near distance of my future. And I love like afterwards the integration that happens and, and it helps keep me in, on target. Like I could go get annoyed with, with some little thing. And I, and I, in my head, I'm kind of like, I'm trying to let things go, like really let them go sooner than later and achieve like, like this state of detachment that I hope to get to like, and I have glimpses of it, but like to not be concerned with whether things are good or bad as they appear, you know, and like so attached to like the mm -hmm. outcomes and to not be so quick to judge good or bad in any situation and just to float with, awareness of the greater vision and my intention for the morning. And that's all I know. I just work here. Like I keep this <laughs> sense of like uh, stupidity, you know, like I don't know what you're talking about is what I do a lot of nope. during the day. I've done it like two or three times a day. I'm like, I don't, I'm, I don't know. With like total honesty. It and reminds love. me like, of that. Uh, yeah. It reminds me of that Byron Katie quote that I love. And it's, she says something like your job is to live and be love and all that you do. The world's job is to push your buttons. <laughs> wow. Well, I think that's probably unavoidable in this life, isn't it? it we're always going to get tested and there's always going to be little things that come up, no matter how utopian the community there's going to be problems there's going to be stressful things we, every single one of us we're human we're human yeah we're human that's right things come up we all we all have different star signs and different psychological profiles and enneagrams and dispositions and backgrounds and we all you know we don't know what triggers each other and sometimes we trigger each other and it's 90 percent of the time it's not intentional and and 
but the trigger happened and and sometimes you know people we feel some type of way when we get triggered and it's sad that people get triggered but it's just part of the thing you know it's gonna happen it's gonna you happen know? yeah yeah and we try to float on well jeff right. it's been it's been amazing to have you on today man i'm really taking away from this conversation this like I just feel this, this, I have this quest now to give my mom to coach her through and, and coach and call myself to the higher standard of giving her a heart hug. And, uh, yeah, you really inspired me today. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you, Kate, for having me. It's been such a pleasure. And I hope some of, some of what I said made sense. I, I feel like I, I kind of rambled at some times and I felt a little like, but hopefully I brought everything back to, to make sense. and. You know, hopefully you'll have me back on. You're, you're, I told you years ago, you're stuck with me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I love I'm you so following much. you. Yeah, I love you so much, Kate. Hey, y'all. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I have the, if you are watching this, I have the camera down so that you can see pajamas right here. She's just snoozing away. I'm here. Well, I'm here with pajamas to say thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here and being part of this community. It is just an absolute honor to bring this show to you. As a type B personality, I'm pretty hair flip proud of myself that I have reached almost four months of weekly episodes and there is no end in sight. I am fully committed to this podcast. I am committed to doing one episode a week for at least a year, maybe beyond. I just, I'm enjoying it so much. So know that when I create these episodes for you, I am having so much fun and I just, I get such a jazz out of bringing this content to you and just sharing my life with you along the way. So please, if you could, whether you're watching this or listening, leave a comment, do a subscribe <laughs> and share this with a friend. Be like, Hey, there's this woman, Kate, and she calls herself an inspirer. And I think you might like her stuff too. She's really real. She's really messy and disorganized, but has some really nuggets of wisdom or whatever you want to say. But do share this with a friend. I'd love to continue to grow this community and continue to bring even more amazing podcasts and stories to you. With all my love from Kate and pajamas. Bye.